Okay. <coughs> Call this special board meeting of USD 350 Board of Education in order. Um, welcome visitors. First action, the calendar for the 2020 through 21 school year. Um, this calendar is uh, a little bit of an adjustment uh, based on the need for uh, staff to plan and prepare for this crazy school year and to implement safety measures. Um, uh, we need to be prepared for some remote learning this year. You know, our goal is to start on site. I think it looks like today we can we can accomplish that by the first day of school. But we need to plan for some kids maybe being remote all year long. Um, you know, if a family chooses that option because they're high risk due to health concerns. Uh, and also, at some point, if the virus hits in our school building and we have to quarantine a class or uh, the whole school or shut down for a period of time, we need to be ready to go immediately. That's going to take some time to prepare. This remote learning is going to be different than last spring. That was an emergency situation. Let's get it figured out in a week and go. This is we're doing school so any remote learning is going to be all day every day uh, not like the 45 minutes for kindergarten we had last year and the three hours for <coughs> high school so we need to be prepared for that to do it right we probably need a few months to prepare this we don't have that we need to get rolling um, so that's the goal with this this calendar trades essentially trades seven student days for staff development days and work days. So that's the trade-off there. The total number of contract days has not changed. Um, essentially delays the start of school by one week. So we have all this time to prepare and get rolling. And then there's some days scattered throughout that um, you know, things will change. Our need for time to plan and build online lessons and uh, all of those things d is not going to end until we're through this pandemic and I can't tell you when that is so uh, we've run this by our district leadership team and the calendar committee this seems to be our best option uh, as of now so. Josh has the state lowered the requirement for liars no and so with this change still in the window we are this this calendar um, professional development time counts as half student time so if we spend one day in professional development it counts as a half a student day so um, so essentially we um, we didn't lose all seven days that we count so we're still about two and a half days above the minimum with this calendar Theoretically, I'm not worried about snow days because if we have a challenging weather day, we could just go remote for that day and not, not lose the day. But this does provide two and a half days above the minimum, so there's some wiggle room if we do have to cancel school. And then there's that leaves some time, you know, a week and a half before we get to Memorial Day that if we do have a pressing issue, we do have to shut down, we've got time to make it up before Memorial Day. I sure don't want to get past Memorial Day and lose kids. Any thoughts? I think the trade-off of student days is justified because we need to do this remote thing better. Hopefully we don't have to do it at all, but we need to be prepared for that and uh, have that trade-off of doing those remote days better, uh, I think is worth it in the end. And Josh, every family does have that capability now? Um, to? Do remote. If we, to say your snow day deal. Not necessarily. We'll, we'll make sure it happens, though. Um, there will be a few that we can't get a hotspot to, like a mobile hotspot they don't have even cell coverage in their area. 
So there will be a handful that may have difficulty. Well, that should all end up on our lap. I think, you know, they can maybe find a spot where we sell coverage is better. Sure. Yeah. And we'll do our best. And we have plenty of uh, that sparks money from, through the CARES Act that's coming through the county. We have plenty of funds available to, to help some families out without having to rely on a third party to do their thing just take care of it. You're, you're not, we, we have one snow day, we may not do that, we may just have a snow day, right? Correct. But if we get yeah. to the end of our, where we're out of, out of extra days, that's what we would have to, yeah, for sure. I'm going to take all the fun out of the current kid and all their snow day that we're still working Kids! Okay. <laughs> yeah, being ready to go, go remote, Immediately is going to be it's going to be the trick. So this is the calendar I would re recommend for approval. Okay. Make a motion we approve the calendar for the fourth. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the calendar for the 2020 through 21 school year. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. School reopening. I think we can all recognize that, uh, um, and I know all public educators would agree, having kids on site at school is important. It's not a political statement. That That is what it is. Um, we all know that the job we do here is very important. We serve a lot of needs for the community. Um, that's particularly more important for the elementary kids. Um, this whole thing is not easy uh, for anybody. There's a lot of unknowns. Uh, and it's, it's not personal, I know, for any of you or uh, for any of us. Uh, and um, it, it, does, it does matter. You know, we do have kids that are at risk. I have my family here. I have asthma. I, it, it is personal for me uh, that, that we do this right. And not just because it's my family, but because we have our school family. So doing this carefully and doing things right is, is not easy. Uh, what, what we have, um, sorry for the sloppy writing, this is what we've talked through with our district leadership team and our operations team. On the left side, what we have is the, the health and you know the health experts and the science experts and the advice and guidance we get there and we have logistics of how we can do school bus and lunch and moving from class to class all those things and then mix that with human nature and people's fears both rational and irrational all of those things are colliding here so it, that's what we're, we're dealing with. Um, we also have all of these entities on the right that give us guidance or rules, regulations, things we have to follow or just guidance that, uh, that we should follow. Um, that last one's the Activities Association. Again, sorry for chicken scratch there. So we have all this at play. Um, you know, a good example of how the health advice we get meets with the logistics of doing school is maintaining six foot distance all the time. I cannot tell parents that that's what we're going to do at school. My third grade class will line up with 25 kids and it will be the entire length of the hallway, 150 feet long. I can't supervise 150 foot long, long line of kids so there's going to be times where we're going to be closer than that six feet. So just an example of how guidance we get or directives we get has to meet with the logistics of doing school. We can't just say, well, forget it, then we're not doing it. So that's been the difficulty that uh, we've been working through uh, trying to get this plan together. 
the timing on this, you know, about three weeks ago, KSDE released their guidance with K Kansas Department of Health and Environment recommendations as well. Uh, the board approved, the state board approved that. Uh, since then, we've had a governor's order to try to navigate. Uh, we have our county commission that could overrule. Uh, KSD had to rule on the start date. Uh, so all of those things have, have kind of been moving along and we can't just wait for all those, but some of that we did have to wait for. So that's, that's why we are here and why we didn't have this plan together in June. So our goals with this plan, Vance, I'll share this screen with you here. Okay. So the goal with the plan is, is really twofold. You know, create and maintain an effective learning environments, which means students are going to be engaged in rigorous learning every day, on site as much as possible. Social and emotional supports provided, equitable access, that's important. Kids need opportunities to the same the same learning learning uh, opportunities and extracurricular and co-curricular activities are an important part of what we do they were before this pandemic and they still are mix that with we need to keep students and staff safe this does not mean we have a plan that will keep anybody and everybody from ever being exposed to the virus the only way to do that is to stay in your house and never ever leave that's the only way to accomplish that so our goal is to limit the spread of the virus as much as possible. That's what we're after. Provide flexible options for families if we have kids at risk that can't be here. Uh, we need to provide an option for them that's an equitable education, just like they were at school, uh, which we couldn't accomplish last spring. Uh, we did our best. And we did a darn good job, I think, but it, it's not enough. Uh, address our physical and mental health needs and implement protocols and practices to ensure that safe environment. So what I'm going to go through here is just this basic operations plan. I've sent this to you. And just so you know, this is just a skeleton of the things that are probably most important that we can get, get all the other details finalized. This does not say exactly what happens when and where you drop off your kid in the morning and when and where you pick up your kid. All those details will be in here uh, in this 10 or 12 pages of all these details. Okay, so that's where we're headed with the plan. But what I'm asking you to approve is this basic operations plan. So what we have is a plan that we've developed with our county health people and neighboring districts we've worked through this we've modified it and Stafford's doing something a little different Maxville's doing something a little different but we're pretty close on on the skeleton of this plan so we have low moderate and high risk depending on what the disease spread and risk level in our community is what's our community our county and surrounding counties we have a lot of people that go to Barton County, Pratt County, uh, Reno County, so we need to consider that. Uh, so what level we will be at, that decision will be made in conjunction with Shannon Snyder, the health department. What does that mean? We're in low right now, the daily case of, uh, the daily rate of new cases is, is very low. The number of cases is very low and uh, there's nothing to decline, so that would be if we're coming, coming down off of a higher period. So if we have a case pop up next week and a case the following week and, and a case the week after that, we remain at low. People will get nervous, like we all have when we, when we see anything pop up. But if the disease uh, is not spreading at an increasing rate, we stay at low. Now if we see one next week, and then three a couple days later, then eight, and then 10, now, now we're on, on alert. Uh, we 
get to a point where we move to more moderate. And then if the case rate is increasing over a period of time, four to six weeks, then we move to the high risk level where we're more than likely off campus. Those approximate group size limits are flexible. We could have group size limit of 50 and we're in low. That's not something we'll determine. That's something that the county would determine. Uh, so moderate, we just put those on there just so 15 to 50 depending on, you know, it's a little bit, we're limited to 15 people. We can't, we can't have a full classroom of kids together. So that changes what we do. 50, we can do it. And then the high, we're probably at that, that 10 person limit. So what does the school environment look like? Again, our goal is to be on site with kids as much as we possibly can. So secondary, it's gonna look different. On site with restrictions, we're gonna run our normal class schedule and remote learning would be an option for families if they choose that. Uh, we'll want families to fill out an application that says, we wanna do this, here's why, um, and then sign off that they're gonna to commit to a semester of doing that. We don't want somebody saying, okay, I don't, we wanna do remote this week and then back in school the following week and back, we just can't deal with that. If there's a health concern they need to do remote, let's stick with that. We'll work with families on that. If we get to, uh, well, the elementary school, same thing, on site with restrictions, and uh, having a remote learning option available to families. If we move to the moderate, uh, we're looking at a hybrid environment, which what we've defined for our secondary is homerooms. So think of that as we have half of the freshman class is in Mr. Bauer's room learning pretty much all day. They have their assignments sent to them. They're doing remote learning in the classroom. They're staying in that classroom so they're not mixing up with other kids. Uh, they can have the test proctored. We have an adult there to help motivate them. If, one of the t if the science teacher needs to sneak in and answer a question for a kid, we can easily we have kids here, can motivate them, control their learning. Uh, we could end up with a hybrid environment where some kids are here and some are at home. Uh, Monday, half the kids are here, uh, half are at home, learning virtually. The next day they flip-flop. We don't see a good way to to do that and accomplish much because you're still bringing the kids in and mixing them up throughout the day so it doesn't accomplish much so we think when we get to more restrictive we'll move to that more of a homeroom environment for elementary school things won't change a lot uh, stable groups is what we're after uh, get used to that term it's easier to keep a stable group first grade stays with first grade they don't mix with the third grade they don't mix with the third grade teacher they are in a stable group just by nature our homerooms would be a stable group freshmen you guys stay together we don't mix with the other classes if we're running a, a high school schedule the kids are mixing up in every class a kid tests positive you can imagine how many kids we have to that that kid came in contact with a kid tests positive for COVID in third grade, it's a little easier to know. This is that stable group. We've limited the spread to that group. So that's what we're after with this. If we end up with needing to limit our group size, we may have to do a hybrid environment where maybe half the kids are here one day and half of them are at home and then we switch. Uh, we don't want to do that. Schools are not a daycare. But when school is in session and kids are learning at school, we all know that that serves that function. The kids have a safe place to be in a hot meal while their parents are at work. So it's, it's more important that we have kids here every day at the elementary level. If we move to a high situation, 
at a high risk level will likely be remote. We will have that option to bring some kids in, special needs, uh, special circumstances, um, and deal with those small groups as needed. I don't know that we ever end up with a complete, nobody's ever coming in the building unless we had an outbreak in the school, then obviously we will for a period of time. These are fluid levels. So we may start once at low, end up at moderate after a couple of months, and then things taper off and we get back to the low, uh, the low risk level. So it will be fluid. Stop me if you have questions, but we've got a lot to roll through and explain. So some of the questions may be answered as we roll along here. During your process, how do you implement your lunch program within that? I'll get there. Okay. Social distancing is an important topic. Um, <clears throat> let me skip to something else real quick because this has a bearing on what we're talking about. The governor's executive order 20-59 puts in place certain mitigation uh, requirements uh, for schools. There's a question whether the governor's office says counties cannot overturn this because it's not a statewide order. It only applies to school districts. I'm no lawyer, but if the governor issues an executive order closing down all bars, I would guess that county commissions can overturn that because that's a statewide order. It, it applies to all bars statewide, just like this applies to all schools statewide. But the county commission according to the Attorney General, can overturn this order. What does this order say? It's not all bad stuff, but it's, I mean, Blaine put it, uh, it's too specific, but at the same time not specific enough. So requiring uh, masks or face coverings at all times for all students, so we have kids as young as three, all of them wear masks all day long, except when they're eating, or if it's unsafe, or if there's a medical condition. Uh, otherwise, they're wearing masks all day long. A good example of this, this requires everybody to wear it at attendance centers, and uh, to be at school, which the playground is at school, even if they're 10 feet apart, you still have to wear a mask according to the letter of this, this order. Even if they're social distancing, they need to wear a mask. Even if other entities have recommended that we may not need to require masks for young elementary kids, we have to require it according to this order. Uh, the other thing is that we maintain six foot distance. The only exception is in the classroom. We can't have that requirement in the classroom because I can only fit 10 kids in the classroom, in our typical classroom. So if there's instruction going on in the classroom, there's an exception. There's no exception for walking down the hall. There's no exception for anything other than just passing each other in the hallway, infrequent and, uh, and uh, incidental moments of close proximity. Hand sanitizer requiring that temperature checks before students enter the building for the first time each day. So temperatures must be taken outside of the building. Check everybody's temperature before they enter the building. That's the letter of the, of the order. Not necessarily bad, but again, too specific for the logistics part of actually doing school. And in my opinion, in some ways, making it more uh, making us more at risk to spread the disease. So, we have that order that right now we have to follow. This plan that we've put together uh, is assuming that our county commission will overturn that order and let us do what we think is right. Uh, Shannon Snyder, I met with her today. She's comfortable with, with all of these recommendations if that governor's order is not in place. So, she's kind of in a tough spot. She can't recommend that the county commission overturned that order. She can't. 
in her position can't really do that. But the way she put it, she's comfortable with what we have in place with this plan if the governor's order is not, does not stand. So our plan is we're going to distance when feasible. And again, back to that limited interactions between separate stable groups. If we get to the moderate, we're going to be more strict about that social distancing. And then if we're in the high range, we'll have to be very strict about it. Any small groups we're bringing to the building, we'll need to be very careful about that. <clears throat> Masks, face coverings, required for all staff and students grades five and up when social distancing is not possible. If we're at recess, we can keep apart. Wearing a mask is not necessary. If a teacher has two kids in the classroom and they can stay apart, we can have a board meeting where we can stay apart. Masks are not required of everybody at, at, during those times. There's certain exceptions, again, from a doctor's note, a medical issue, uh, uh, PE when they're doing strenuous activity, we keep them apart. Uh, things like that where it's not safe in the weight room. Uh, I would be concerned about limiting the oxygen intake when you got a barbell over your head. Um, that doesn't really change with the moderate level. Uh, oh, back up. Uh, Masks for grades five and up students and all staff and recommended for younger grades. KDHE says that the virus does not, it has been shown to not spread as much with kids under the age of nine. Uh, so that's why there's less of a concern with the younger, younger kids. Also, you can imagine trying to keep a kindergartner, a full kindergarten class in masks all day long. We'll do our best. Um, I know our staff, some of the conversations that came up, we don't want to do it, but if that's what we have to do to keep from going remote, then it's worth it. Nobody wants to do this remote learning. We want to, we want to keep everybody in school. Lunch, we'll keep our separate stable groups. We'll use the cafeteria. The gym deck, uh, in the main gym, put tables up there. So third and fourth grade go to lunch at the same time. Third grade eats in the cafeteria. Use all those tables in there. They spread out. They can stay six feet apart. They can stay in their stable group. Put fourth grade up on the deck in the gym. We, can, we have tables up there. They can spread out, stay apart, uh, eat their lunch, and then they can go to recess and we can keep them on, on one half of the playground and they can flip flop tomorrow. Um, so you're going to serve in two different locations? We're going to serve in the cafeteria. They come get their food, take it up on the deck, and then the other class comes in and they'll eat in the cafeteria and sanitize as best we can between, between groups. Not much different for the moderate. I think we can do that. So again, our goal is separate stable groups. Uh, the details of when we do that and who goes when, and staggering the arrival times, uh, those are the details where we've almost got worked out. It would take a little bit more work. If we're remote, it'll probably be pickup and delivery. Breakfast is a different animal because we have two first graders and four second graders and three third graders and a handful of kids from each grade that are eating breakfast. Uh, uh, so this is one we're still working on, but uh, how do we do that? Having them sign up so we know who is coming to breakfast We keep the first graders down here and the second graders over here. Still use the deck area. Grab and go breakfast has been popular for our high school or 7 to 12. That won't be allowed. We're not going to allow the kids to pick up their breakfast and go to the classroom and eat it without their mask on. That's going to further spread the virus. Um, 
it, we may consider for our younger grades, K through four, they do pick up the grab and go and the go eat it in their, in their classroom. So that one's still a work in progress, but we're getting closer. PE, music, art, um, those things for elementary, that's a concern if we're sending our stable groups to this classroom and then another group coming in. So uh, our plan now is to uh, have PE in the old gym and music for elementary in the auditorium where so they can spread them out. Uh, so first grade goes to PE and does their thing outside as much as possible. In uh, second, well, second grades in the auditorium for music, and then they can make the switch. With everything, we're not putting anything in the plan that says like PE. We're going to do that outside. Just everything, it, whether it's math class or PE or music, get outside as much as you can. If you're supervising the lunchroom and it's nice out. We can take these kids out, let's go outside and eat. So that will be in our plan and we do that as much as possible with every, every activity. Uh, if we move to the moderate, we'll need to be more careful about moving kids around um, and sharing supplies and equipment. So we may get to a point where uh, maybe the teacher comes in, the, the music teacher comes in the classroom and those kids don't leave. Uh, so we'll have to be flexible with that depending on the spread. Nothing magical with secondary PE, uh, other than this would be one area where uh, they're physically exerting themselves. Masks won't be required if we can keep, keep the distance, which is easier to do in the PE classroom. Band, I don't know. We're, we've got work to do on band and choir and, uh, and uh, how we're going to handle that. Activities, uh, for now, practices, games, concerts will be allowed. Understanding the group size restrictions, uh, requiring masks for patrons, uh, people coming to watch. Uh, we may have to have no crowds uh, for a ball game or a concert. Um, this is something that we all need to be on the same page about, that remote learners may participate. The Activities Association has made a special exemption for uh, if you're doing virtual school and you don't attend our school, uh, we don't allow those kids to participate. You can allow them to attend one class and then allow those kids to participate in athletics. Uh, we don't allow that. With uh, If we have a student that's at high risk and the family does not want that kid coming to school, being exposed to the entire student body for seven hours during the day, but they still want to participate and run cross country and only be exposed to that group of kids, I can see the case to be made that that makes sense. On the other hand, if it's not safe for you to send your kid to school, why is it safe for you to send your kid to sports practice and so we've we've wrestled with that um, I want every kid out for an activity that that makes our school better um, if the family has made the choice that junior can't come to school because we're concerned about his health and safety and be exposed to all of the students in the school but are comfortable with him participating in, uh, in one activity with a limited group of kids, I can see that being beneficial for that kid. So that's our recommendation right now. Uh, if we move to that moderate, we'll likely get to the point where we just can't have crowds. Maybe we can still have a ball game. Maybe we can still have a concert. We just can't bring in uh, the whole town of Ellenwood to come watch the basketball game. That's going to contribute to the spread.
the remote learners, those would be ones that are doing remote learning through us, though, not themselves. Yes, yes, <laughs> to clarify. That would be kids that I'm enrolled in St. John's schools. I have a, a lung condition that doesn't, that, or an immune disorder that I should not be around that many people, but I'm going to do all the schoolwork that all the other kids are doing all day long, not I'm just doing virtual school at Elkhart. So, good question. Uh, transportation, uh, we're going to require masks of everybody. We'll sanitize the commonly touched areas after each route or to get on and off, those things. If we can keep kids apart, we will. Assigning seats, families can sit together. Had some parents call and say, "Hey, we'll just bring our kids to Hudson. That way, we either we're all there, and the kids are on the bus less time, and make it easier." So we have had some parents step up and say, and offer to do some of those things. Uh, but we still need to transport those kids. Will the bus driver be responsible for taking the temperature? Before yes. They get on the bus? Yeah. Take their temperature before they get on the bus. So and then if we end up they're making the call to say you can't get on the bus. <coughs> yep, it's it's not an option. It's over 99.6. Sorry, you can't get on the bus today. And that kid's responsibility is to remote learners until or to just call in sick today. And and then there will be the protocols that okay, if there's other symptoms now we need to get with the health department to see if the testing is required. Bathrooms, nothing special there. We just need to be more diligent about sanitizing those areas during the day. In a typical year, we refill supplies and uh, clean up messes, but they get cleaned either before or after school uh, for the day. Um, drinking fountains, we're going to close those off. We've ordered some bottle fillers. We have bottle fillers. Um, every kid will have a water bottle that we'll have to clean each night. Sanitize one. Bathrooms, is everything going to be hands free? Um, right now, everything is hands free. All of the toilets and sinks are hands free in the main campus for the most part. Uh, paper towel dispensers are not. Soap dispensers are not. So we won't get there day one okay. uh, just with ordering supplies. but. Are you going to be able to get supplies? I don't know. That's a concern. Some things, yes. We got a whole bunch of hand sanitizer today, but there's some other. It's just hard to hard to know who has stuff in stock. And we can order something, and we don't know when it's coming. So, uh, visitors um, only those absolutely necessary for instructional purposes. We need a special speaker for instructional purposes. We can do that as long as it's approved by the principal. Uh, <coughs> uh, parents coming to eat lunch with kids. Uh, parents coming into the classroom to uh, do their birthday parties is, is not going to be allowed this year. They can still do their parties just bringing two or three families in to do the Valentine's party is is not a good idea. And we'll do our best. You know, our offices will be open. Uh, and any visitors, if we get to that moderate level, uh, we really do our best to restrict the office only. Uh, hygiene, teach, kids proper hand washing technique. Our goal is to wash hands or use sanitizer hourly. Uh, come into class, put it on. Or you leave class for the next hour, put it on. Uh, elementary, a lot of them have sinks in their classroom. Uh, uh, screening, <clears throat> this has been a topic of, of much discussion. And where we landed on this is the governor's requirement says that temperatures must be taken before the school day 
we're going to put that on families to do that. Families must take the temperature before sending them to school. <clears throat> Staff must take their own temperature before they come to work. 99.6 degrees or higher, they don't come to work, they don't come to school. Uh, I've been doing this long enough to know that sometimes a parent really needs to get to work today and will say the temperature was taken but didn't take it. Or for whatever reason, we're not doing that crap, just go to school. Um, and the other side of that is, or uh, give them Tylenol and they don't have a fever and send them anyway. So teachers will take the students' temperatures in the first period within the first 10 minutes of the day, just to verify that we slip through the cracks. Uh, temperatures for those riding the bus will be checked as they load the building. If they come in after, if they come in late, we'll screen them in the office. Now, why would we bring kids into the building and then check their temperature? It's nice to say that all, all we have to do is put somebody at the door and they can check the temperatures and that's fine on the morning like today was just wait out there and keep six feet apart while you wait in line to have your temperature checked and they come in and we'll check their temperatures but tomorrow it's raining from seven o'clock to nine o'clock now what am i going to do with that line of kids i'm going to bring them in the building and now I've got these kids, not social distance and mixed grades, just getting away from all this stable group stuff we just talked about. Uh, so it's nice to say that we're going to check everybody's temperature before they walk in the door, but it's not going to happen that way every day. I cannot guarantee that that's what's going to happen. We've done our best to keep third grade with third grade, eat with third grade, play recess with third grade, learn with third grade. Now tomorrow when you come to school, line up with second, with first and second grade as you come in the building to have your temperature taken. See where we're at with that on the whole stable group thing. If a kid tests positive for COVID on Wednesday, Kid has a fever. We've got him in line with the third grader with first and second graders in line, has a fever, test positive for COVID. All of those kids in that line we need to quarantine or they're at risk for being exposed to that virus. If the kid walks in the door, walks to his classroom, in his third grade classroom, who do we need to be worried about testing or having to quarantine? Just that same stable group which if he tests positive on Wednesday, all of the kids he was exposed to on Monday and Tuesday, we need to be concerned about as well. So not only the kids he was standing next to in line on Wednesday, but also Monday and Tuesday. If he goes to the classroom and we take his temperature there, it's just those third graders. We think that doing that at the door in line is going to increase the spread of the virus, not decrease it. Stable groups is where we're at. No more gym before school. No more gym before school. When they show up to school, they go to their first out. They go to their classroom or they go to their first out. Is there any other testing throughout the day? Uh, in it, temperature only if there's symptoms. If there's a reason to believe that we need to check temperatures, uh, we'll do that. So, are we letting, is there a potential for a kid to get through the door in the classroom? And that kid has a fever? Yes. But if that kid tests positive for COVID, he was already here yesterday and the day before, and that's close contact uh, those two days before. So to ensure that temperatures get taken every day, when that teacher's gone, when that temperature checker at the door that we said was going to take the temperatures every day, which who wants to volunteer to do that, by the way? Uh, it's not going to happen every day. It's not going to happen every day. I can assure that this is going to happen every day. 
Mrs. Christie's gone and she has a sub. I know that's going to be in her sub plans. Where's the thermometer? We're going to check those temperatures. We know. Okay, kid. Tests above 99.9. What after that you sent home? What's the criteria to get back to school? You have to have a good test. What do you get? I mean, you know what I mean. It depends. I'll be up to the medical professionals. So to they have to determine to what to do. The doctor. The doctor is going to need to determine. The health department is going to need to determine whether a test is needed, and then that that will tell us how long the kid has to be out when the test result gets back. Right. You're getting ready to be right the lab. Yeah. Yeah. So we will not be quarantining every everybody in the school because uh, Junior has a fever. My child a couple weeks ago had a fever. Not feeling well. They didn't think it was strep. They didn't think so. They, had, they required her to test. I didn't need to quarantine. My family didn't need to quarantine unless we had symptoms. So we need to be careful with that. But just because somebody has a fever, it might be because they have an infected tooth. So we're not going to shut down the world because a kid has a fever. We're just going to be careful about it. Do you think a lot of houses in our community have working thermometers? <clears throat> and do you think they'll actually take If they don't, they'll get them home. Okay. Do you think they'll actually take their temperatures at home? Yes. Yep. Josh, some temperatures run lower and some okay. temperatures run higher than 99.6. Right. So if I have a child that comes in at 99.7 or 0.8, that kid's not going to be allowed to come in. I mean, I know we're splitting the hairs here yeah. a little bit, but yeah. I think if we're checking with the surface thermometer, where they just need a little forehead. Anybody know what the effect of like a stocking cap or a hat is with that? I have no clue. Depends on what they're doing. If they have a <clears throat> what's that? If they're running around, horsing around, or they come in or sweat, they're going to test high. And there will be some leeway for okay, yeah, it's 80 degrees out this morning and the kid ran to school. It's obviously hot. We'll, we'll still have to use our brain. And if you do have a kid that's consistently running high, let's get a note from the doctor. We can work through some of those issues. But what I'm not willing to do is say, we're putting a dozen people outside the doors and temperatures are going to get checked before they enter the building. It's not going to happen every day. In a perfect world, yes, we live in the real world. And the panic about, oh my God, we let a kid in to the first grade classroom and now that kid has a fever. The kid was already exposed to the other kids two days before. We think this is best to accomplish that goal of making sure temperature are checked for every kid. Do we need our school nurse to be full time? Uh, yes, and I haven't. She had been part time because of her health, so if she, if she can, yes, we will. Uh, we will. We'll make sure every kid has masks. And then you kind of color coordinated like Monday you wear green and Tuesday you wear blue? Well, we had a, a vendor that um, there was, you know, there was a set of five masks and yeah, he, there was a color for each day. And I don't know if it's necessary to wear specific color each day, but come in a mesh bag so every kid has a mesh bag with their five masks and 
They can use one each day, and then on Friday they turn the mesh bag in. It's got the name on it. We throw them in the laundry, wash them there. They have them back on. Some kids will choose to have their own. We're not going to stand in the way of that. Uh, we're going to do any testing to ensure that it's adequate. No, I mean if it's, I don't, I don't have the science on that. But the home masks that are coming to school, they once they get to the campus, they can stay here, so we can wash them. Not necessarily. No. They, you know, the older the kids are, they can be responsible for their own. They can home and wash it. Well, I guess I was primarily thinking of the elementary. Yeah, our elementary, I think our goal is to have masks for uh, for them, and we will take care of washing them for them. Okay. And in that same thought I had earlier with allergy season, you guys know, it's not they just, I mean, they can hardly breathe, or they're snotted up, and they're getting inside their masks, they may have to go through two masks, especially yeah. the younger kids. It, it's miserable wearing a mask. It's no fun. I, I feel for the medical professionals that have to do it all the time. I'm sure you get used to it. We're going to have to take breaks. I'm tired of wearing this stupid thing. Let's go outside. Let's take a lap. Get the masks off. There's going to be some of that. But that sparks money. Uh, we've got 180-ish thousand dollars for our area in the county basically the middle part of the county for st john city uh, i don't remember if hudson city is included in that or not but uh, and the rec commission and ministerial alliance uh, and the city doesn't have a high need so I'm guessing we have about $150,000 of funds to use. That's more than I think we can use. So when we're talking about getting masks for everybody, if we don't use that money, it goes back to the state. And if they don't use it, it goes back to the feds. So I don't like, I'm, it's an uncomfortable position to be in to say, we have the money, let's use it. But it's there, it, it feels frivolous. On the masks, when we have no cases in the county, is that going to be lenient a little bit more? Like uh, right now, our risk level is extremely low here. Right. I think our philosophy needs to be starting off strict. Uh, we can always back it off. I think it's going to be more difficult if we say, ah, it's pretty easy now, let's not do any of that. And then starts to ramp up now we're going to try to implement uh, like my philosophy just like advice we give to teachers start off the year start off strict you can always back off it's harder to go the other way and try to implement more strict procedures two weeks in then if we start off strict and we realize hey we can relax on some of this we can do that uh, <clears throat> What I don't excuse me. What I don't understand is this man still protecting the kids when the kids are basically showed that they don't even hardly ever I mean the new amount of application stuff. It's actually pre preventing the spread, helping to prevent the spread from kid to kid, from kid to adult. But yet in the to kid out school, all these kids are running together, have fun, go to sports, play that close. And that's okay, but in school you can't do it. Yeah. And do they that's why nobody was in speaking. And do they feel once you're sitting down at your desk, they can be like, man, every desk is sort of this is part of it, do they feel that there's that much chance, I guess, of contracting when they're sitting down at their, you know, seat? You know, I guess I think about that, you know, we're allowing take the mask off and work out the gym or doing that, well you're exhaling even stronger than that sure. in the gym or in that position than you are when you're sitting at this desk. I think it, I think that's more of a matter of, yeah, when I'm sitting at this desk, but I'm sitting next to this kid three feet away for 45 minutes. It's, if I'm in PE, we're, we're moving. So 
I, I get you. I, I, I get a lot of places I've been where the capacitors are required, a lot of times you have to wear them wherever you get them then unless you're there. Yeah. And that's so right now we're under the, the governor's order that all kids wear masks. The county commission is comfortable lifting, uh, going away from that order if we have a plan in place that takes care of those, uh, what's in that plan but makes more sense for us. Um, I think if I take this plan to the county commission and say, we're not gonna require masks of anybody I think their only option is going to be to say, we can't go against the governor's order, uh, and that's going to stand. Because part of the law that says they can overturn a governor's executive order, they have to consider uh, what the health professionals said. I know that Shannon Snyder is not going to tell the county commission that yes, I agree, that's okay, we should overturn that order if, if masks are not required in some capacity. Are the volleyball, football, cross country, are they gonna have that mask on when they're participating? No, just like PE. Physical exertion is part of that. Part of that uh, makes it not safe to wear it. For competition, Keisha has put out a set of guidelines for every sport. Yes. Um, everybody is to be, you know, adults, and you know, they put out guidelines for every single sport, I think. Right. And so is, uh, like, for football, um, we just ordered splash guards that you attach to your face mask that really helps with that. Um, Dr. Coach Nasser, he's trying to do a no-level type of situation with the kids aren't all of them yet. Doesn't totally limit the contact, but it absolutely helps as far as the next very uh, excelling. So I think there's an option for maybe some masks for kids, like if they're not on volleyball or something. It just as well off to keep it six feet So the governor's order says masks on everybody all the time unless you're eating, basically. We don't think that's feasible. If kids are at recess and can social distance, or if it's physical exertion and it's going to be dangerous, uh, or if they're doing doing something that would make it impossible to wear the mask, we want that flexibility. We'll do our best to put them on the younger kids, but uh, we want that flexibility to not have to require that of every kid. Nobody wants to do it, but the consensus of our, our district leadership team, they, they kind of put it well, I don't remember who said it, but if that's what we've got to do to keep us from going remote, then we'll figure it out. It's not going to help with, if a kid tests positive, and we're wearing masks in the classroom, or we're not wearing masks in the classroom, that really doesn't have an effect. It's not preventing you from getting the disease, absolutely. So when they contact trace, if we're, we have close contact and we're always wearing masks, he's still considered a close contact. If we're not wearing masks, he's still considered close contact. I did ask that question of Shannon. The library, uh, we're going to uh, basically be closed to students coming over here. So classroom sets will be delivered over to the, uh, to the classes. Uh, the secondary students can check out a book and they'll bring it over. Uh, books are difficult to sanitize. You think about reading a book, you're looking at your fingers and turning the pages, and you can't sanitize every page, so really, they just have to quarantine the books for a while before we can use them again. And uh, being open to the public is also important. Uh, so bringing the kids and public together is not a good idea. Uh, we feel we can service the school in a manner uh, that's still effective. And 
checking temperatures of, of patrons as they enter the building. Playgrounds, very difficult to sanitize. We've ordered some electrostatic sanitizing sprayers. It basically just takes a disinfectant and charges the particles as it sprays it out. Uh, so they're statically uh, charged and it attaches to equipment. Rather than just wiping down the surface, it will adhere to everything. So we'll use those, but that would be something that periodically we'll we'll do our best to sanitize. Uh, it's just not something that we can do on a daily basis. So washing hands before they go out to recess and when they come back in is uh, how we'll try to mitigate that spread. Recess will only be with their class. Third and fourth grade use the same example. Uh, lunch, third and fourth grade are eating in separate places. They go out to recess at the same time. Fourth grade, you get the equipment today. Third grade, you stay on the blacktop in the field. Tomorrow, we'll switch it. So, still trying to keep those groups separate as much as possible. Are they going to play together after school? Yeah, I can't. We can't control what happens away, away from school. In the planning process, bringing in a teacher team early and planning to, to do all this, or you can bring all this affiliated. With, yes, exactly. Or you can bring all this affiliated with these non-contract people. You know, as far as just being yes, part of we're going to need to. Yes. Yeah. And some of that's limited by like our special ed staff. They're limited on how many professional development days they can have actually how many hours that the co-op is reimbursed so that's a little out of our control but we do need them here so all the sanitizing extra sanitizing that's going to be done by our current janitorial staff or yeah. by our teachers slash janitorial uh, staff. teachers may have to do some uh, between we have instruments and music class wipe down the instruments between classes Everybody will have a cleaning kit in the room, you know, wipes when the first hour is over, sanitize the desk real quick. Do you feel like we have enough janitorial staff in another room or anything like that to help? I, I think we're good there. There's, there's room for, for improvement that we do. This is a situation where not everybody's going to be happy. Uh, I'm used to that when we have, uh, and you all should be used to that as school board members. When you have an issue, you make a decision, there's some on this side of the issue that are not happy, some on this side of the issue that are not happy. This is particularly difficult, I think, because all of these decisions we make, though the side that's not happy on each side is much larger. There's going to be people that feel we're not doing enough with this. There's going to people be people that feel we're doing way too much. We've got to pick a plan and go with it and adjust as we move along. This is not set in stone. This will be flexible. If we find a reason to change, we will change it. We will learn new things as we go along, and we'll adjust. So if we want everybody to be happy, we're headed down the wrong road. Uh, all of those, the governor, the legislature, all those have something to say about what we do. As of today, I think this is as close as we've gotten to. We can live with this. We can make make this happen. We can make school happen with this plan. Is it perfect? No. Is it workable? Yes. Does it fit a lot better with what we can make work with the logistics of doing school than what the governor's strict order is? Absolutely.
Uh, our district leadership team, we're talking six teachers, is who's had a say in this. Um, we had an operations team meeting, uh, food service, transportation, custodial representative from each of those. Um, wasn't a lot of input on, on that group. Um, without having a plan together to say, hey, give us feedback on this and we can adjust. It was difficult. Um, Sandra Davis didn't have a lot to say about what we're going to do on the buses. So uh, it wasn't real effective, but we did our best. Um, we've not surveyed parents as to what their preference is, what they want to do. Um, I didn't feel I could put out a survey to parents to say, are you comfortable sending your kid to school without knowing what school might look like? Same thing with staff. Are you com comfortable coming to school? Well, it depends on what what it what it looks like. So, having a scale of basic operations plan in place. Uh, now we've got some direction of if you all approve that uh, we can start those conversations. Of course, they're post enrollment now. It's, if you feel comfortable coming to school? Let's get enrolled. So again, the plan will look like uh, like this. We'll have what, what happens when an individual tests positive. We'll have that laid out. Um, what are we going to do with the facilities? What do we do with visitors? Uh, when they come in the building, what are we going to do with them? Um, transportation, what are we, how are we handling that? What are we going to specifically do for lunch? All of those things, and this basic operations plan is just part of that. Get more specifics. And then uh, what else I've included there is just a quick guide for parents, uh, depending on what decisions we make tonight, uh, just to be able to get this out. Parents don't want to go look through that plan and read all the specifics. Uh, not everybody wants to do that. There's some specific questions that people have. How are we going to do school? When are we starting? Are we going to learn at school? Uh, do you have to wear masks? All of that. So, just laying that out, what our goal is to help prevent the spread, health and safety. This is all coming from that spreadsheet that I just showed you. And our phased approach, what does that mean? Doesn't get too many specifics on how exactly we're going to do school, but just a one pager to say, here you go. This is this is what it's going to look like. And again, this has that remote learning students may participate, and then making it clear if we go to remote learning, we don't want some families to say, well, we got along okay in the spring. We can spend a couple hours a day doing school. And, you know, it's a full day. Log the time, submit a sheet, and you, you put in the time. We can't count the kids as students unless that's done. A lot to take in. I could put the plan out to all staff members and say, tell me what you think. And of the 75, 80 employees we have, probably get 75 or 80 uh, different opinions. There's a lot of information there. Some are going to be happy, some are not. If there's a reason to change something, to help keep the virus from spreading, Make sure we can go to school every day. We'll consider. What's the right thing to do? I don't know. I had a conversation with a superintendent colleague today. Well, I just feel like we have to go with the governor's order because uh, if, 
follow it to the letter of the law because I'm not a medical professional. I'm an educator. I'm not a medical professional either. Our governor's not a medical professional either. She's not an educator. There's not, there's not horrible things in that order. It's just tough to do all of them exactly like it says we do them. We can't tell parents we're going to do that and still have school. We need some flexibility. I think our plan strikes that balance. Again, what I'm asking the board to approve is this basic operations plan as it's been presented here. If you're not comfortable with that, all of it's open for discussion. Edits. details on all the specifics and I'll probably bring that to the board for approval at least for your review depends on the I guess the level of your comfort level if, if it's just a minor change just a simple email are you guys okay if we make this change make it be done with it if it's something major we may have to just get back together and, and make a formal change Some school districts have said, yeah, we're going to follow the governor's order, but we're not going to have the younger elementary kids require them to be in masks. But that's going against the governor's order. So, At what point is the commissioner meeting to approve not following it? Or Wednesday. Wednesday. So we could approve this and then have to backtrack. I'm almost certain if we go with this plan, they will be comfortable overturning the governor's order. But do they? They make a county-wide decision, so it's going to be dependent on Maxwell. And yes, and both of their plans. I, I believe both of their plans. They're going basically going with the governor's order. I showed them this plan, which there's been some minor tweaks. I showed them this document last week. Okay. So what does this look like if the order is not overturned? Strict six foot social distancing. 
except in the classroom. Everywhere else, we're six feet apart. Masks, the governor's order is everybody all the time, except in meeting and special cases. And based on this, Anticipate we'll have the kids say, I'm not wearing a stupid mask. Mm -hmm. okay. Just like, I'm not going to math class today. <laughs> <laughs> All those things. Yeah. It, it'll be an issue to deal with. It's not. It's not an issue we want to deal with. <laughs> it's not. None of, none of this is stuff we want to deal with. And then the temperature is also you know, checked daily before entering the building. Which is, I'm curious to see how some schools get it done. Actually follow the order, get it done every day. We have a meeting a week from today, our regular meeting. This will be the topic of discussion. So we have one week and no staff or students are even coming in the building to make a decision today. Something can be tweaked next week. I'm not recommending we do that. But we need to pick a direction and run with it. Let's get going. motion to either approve this or we need to say if there's any modifications we got to make what we can approve. And we're just approving this operational skeleton or whatever. Yep. Yeah, the basic operations plan is what we labeled it as in, in our reopening plan. So that would just be the part of the basic operations plan. And you told me earlier the teachers are responsible for, of course, taking care of making sure everything is kosher, just like you said. Okay. 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 Josh, I can't, I can't support wearing masks either. I think it should be optional. Okay. For the staff and students. On the masks, was there any direction from the commissioners or Shannon as far as if we didn't have that part in the plan, what did you? I know Shannon said she cannot support it if masks are optional if masks are not required at some level uh, she can't support that part of it okay now the commissioners then make make up their mind that's I, I can't speak for them I spoke with one commissioner today and he said the ball was in our court. We we kind of made up the rules that we wanted to do. I 
like all your plans, Josh. I just don't like the mask mandate. Sure. I, no, I understand. I don't. I don't like it either, but I think it's what we have to do. Honestly, I think that's right. I said too. I think I think we'd be crucified if we didn't wear masks and we had an outbreak in the classroom and every kid in the classroom got it. Yeah. We didn't, and we didn't even take the one necessary step to protect half the kids or the or the teacher or somebody. I just don't think wearing a mask is that big a deal. Honestly, I think we should do it. I don't know. I understand where you're coming from, but the, I kind of have a chuckle inside a little bit. At a sporting event, our athletes aren't required to wear a mask. And I know that's not quite comparing apples, but they're exposed to each other. They're tackling each other or running each other going up the volleyball. There is liability of exposure during that sport. But I think we are supposed to control the parts that we can control. Kind of with your point about the kids going and hanging out together after school. Well, if the group of kids goes out after school and does drugs, does that mean we should allow them to use drugs here? Because what well, they're going to do it anyways. You know what I mean? It's yeah. I think we have to do what we have to do to protect the people when they're under our supervision and in our care. Right? And if they get it playing MAYP basketball, that's on them. They're the ones that have to answer that, not us. And to that, they're going to be doing other activities without masks. They're going to be in PE without a mask. They're going to go in the bathroom and take their mask off because they're tired of wearing it. Uh, we're going to have a few kids that have a medical exception. We'll, we may have some kids walking around without a mask. Does that mean then that well, we've got four kids that don't wear a mask all day long and one teacher? It doesn't matter at all. No, it does because we've got most of our people wearing them most of the time. Is that helping to mitigate the spread of the disease in our building? Again, I'm not a doctor, but that's the advice we're giving. That's what it takes to stay in school. To not go remote. That's going to help keep the disease from spreading. Keep us from going remote.
reopening operations guideline as presented. May I have a second? Moved and seconded that we approve the uh, reopening plan as submitted. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. No. Okay. So, so that was needs four need four votes to pass. Okay. Any motion needs four votes to pass. Motion to decline. So, what adjustment do we need to feel comfortable with? Like, what do we need to do? Huh? Masks are really the only issue that we're. That's the only, that's the only opposition I have with it. Is it just make it optional and I vote for it? Optional in all areas or optional in some? I mean, there's in, some in areas. My, in, my, in my perfect world, I would like to see the kids wear masks in the hallways and maybe in the lunch line, but in the classroom, they can take it off. I would vote for anything that's optional. Yeah, I mean, all kinds of rules and regulations will make it work for you, too. I mean, it would not work. I just, I just think somehow we're punishing kids. That seems like we're not talking about the disease. It's not even passed from kid to kid. The teachers probably, maybe, they will wear masks, but I just want to see put their kids through their masks. How many cases in not only Stafford County, but the surrounding county that kids have had? I don't know. To me, we're just, um, I just feel like we're running scared on this deal for the kids not going to have it. Do I want my kid to have it or anybody else? No, but I just feel right to make it a kid wear a mask. Randy, what's your thought? This is uh, I've already seen one discussion this already with the church. You know, what do we do throughout the process? You know? and that was that was tough. It came down to wear a mask to where you're and you're about to take it off uh, unless things were it got worse. Uh, I, sh I struggle same same points as there's other places we're going to, you know, in the sports and be in contact, but I also uh, I guess my biggest point is the time the amount of time they're going to be in that house. Said you put it out and recess, I guess, and get it off. But I mean, there either needs to be some, something different to make sure they have some time out of that mask to sit there for, I don't know what the time schedule will be. You know, maybe there needs to be something implemented if we're going to have to wear the mask if there's time to take that break or that break. I don't know. I mean, it is a long time to sit there. And this is when socially. Social distancing is not possible. But I'm, 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 I'm all in line, but I want all, all the safety precautions I need to take. I mean, it, it is true. Sure.
before I went through graduation, and it was, just, it was uh, I did. I had to do it no different than they'll have to do if that's what we decide. to approve the basic operations plan uh, with no reference to masks right now. Okay, then we can run with this and get to get a visit with the county commission on Wednesday. If you visited with them Wednesday, could we get Shannon to come to the next meeting? We're we'll trying to get that part finalized to provide us some guidance there of what the commissioners and what she's going to require us to have at the moment. I'd like to know how the teachers are doing. We may have some that are doing that one way or the other. Or they, I mean, yeah. I know, I know some will say, I, I don't want to wear a mask at all. I think it's stupid. And we'll have some that say, masks aren't required. I don't feel comfortable coming to work. Nobody's told me that directly, but talking to other districts, that's that's what uh, where the opinions are on this deal. So we'll have some families that say, my kid has to wear a mask when he come to school. We'll have some families that say, if masks aren't required, then we're not coming to school. So when you guys have put in a lot of work on this? I'm not against that. No, none of none of this is personal. I don't take it personal. It's not. We got all those people telling us what we can and can't do and what's right, yet I don't know. So I guess at this point my recommendation would be to have the board approve this plan with no mask mandate and uh, see what the county commission does. Can, can I amend that to, to just say it's uh, optional? Mm -hmm. So those who want to can wear it, those who don't, don't have to. So I just change the wording to masks optional for all staff and students? Yeah, I'd be comfortable with that and then see what the county commissioners, they may tell us to adjust it or they may say, let's try it. Is that just for when the risk level is low? Yeah, I think if, you know, if we have an outbreak, then I think we need to revisit it and do something different. But right now, my opinion is, is the threat level is pretty low and uh, just masks are pretty uncomfortable. I spent the weekend in one down in Oklahoma City and uh, I just didn't want to put our kids through that because I think it'd be a distraction from learning. So if I change this, if you're looking at the computer screen, the low area, masks optional for all students and staff <clears throat> on the low and then leave it here for the moderate and high. I, I would go for that. Is that a motion? Yes. Sorry. No. Good question. Okay. Got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the reopening plan as amended. All those in favor say aye. I, I got a question. Yeah. yeah I do what, too. what puts us, if, we're, if we start out in the low, Josh, then what puts us in the moderate? Switch, make a switch to put your mask on? Um, if we start to get more cases um, <laughs> where the daily rate is not increasing a lot, but we have two cases that pop up tomorrow, and then two cases the following day, and then two more cases the next day. So that would be a flat rate of growth. We're not really growing of two, then four, then eight, then 
what well, about then on a what if the case pops up in our school? Would that automatically bump us up? Probably, yes. And that's I, I don't know the answer to that. That I mean, theoretically, it's still based on the disease spread in our community. If we have one kid that quarantines and one kid that tests positive, that doesn't mean that the disease spread in the community has changed. We just, I mean, we may have to shut down the building for a couple of days. It, and who makes that decision? It would be us with the cooperation with Shannon. So if the plan is for you to talk to the commissioners on Wednesday, why would you vote to put it in there today? On Wednesday, they say I have I have to have a plan that okay I could like I have this plan I can take it to them and then they would be deciding well they we're okay with that we're not okay with that. I need to take them a plan that says the board supports this plan. Are you okay with it or not? If you're not okay with it, what? If they're not okay with it, they just let the governor's order stand. Or did they have a different mandate? They can modify the mandate. Yes, they can modify the order. Safe to wear a 
cloth mask over here, mop the nose. So there will be those things, and we can't list them all. But, and, and when social distancing is not possible. So if they can stay apart. They don't have to wear masks. In our classrooms, that's not possible. Something has to be done on, on that. I mean, it, the decision needs to be made about what we're doing with masks. So it needs to be that we don't require masks in any situation ever, or we require masks for all kids, staff all the time. We're somewhere in between. I, I just don't know what, what that is. I, Vance's motion was to make this masks are optional, and then if we move to that moderate, they're required uh, for certain in that regard so to change it would be just make it masks are optional for staff and students everywhere all the time or one of my problems with the optional is we're spending all this time keeping the kids separated into their groups and then if they're optional all the time, why are we keeping them separate in their groups? Because um, there's going to be times in the hallways and other places they're going to be passing. I don't know if it's more optional when they're in the classroom, just with that group, when they're always going to be at risk with those same kids. But the problem there is the high school where those groups change between every classes. I don't know. I don't like completely optional, but I struggle with the required all the time too, especially like Raymond was saying. It's a struggle to wear those all day long. And how do we get them breaks in there? Is that inside the classroom when, I don't know. It did advance. Vance, did you mention like at the, if it were that Raymond you mentioned maybe taking them off at the desk when you two? I, I, I said my, my perfect world would be they wear in the hallways when they're meeting, passing a bunch of people. You know, sometimes the hallways are a little congested places, but then when they get in the classroom, they can take them off so they're not they're not focusing on their face masks, they're focusing on what the teachers teaching. So, and then also wear them in the lunch line when they're you know going in front of the buffet line or or whatever. But that was one thought I had. Yeah. 
There's a, yeah, there's a. I just, wear, I just had to wear that mask this week, and then I was constantly picking up my face and pulling the mask down. I thought, man, this is, this isn't going to go well to sit in the classroom for eight hours of the day or, or however many hours. I just, I felt like I was running out of breath yeah. after wearing it for an hour to an hour and a half. If we make it possible. I think we require them, or we don't. We require them for certain people or certain groups of people. As a board policy, or we don't. Uh, I don't know that we want to get into, I don't know that you all want to get into all of these details of what are the specific places in the building, and what are the specific activities, and how we make those decisions of when a mask is required and when it's not and when they should wear it and when they shouldn't that I think as a matter of policy which is what this this operations plan is well I don't think it's going to be required to wear it to the that's this one say that again I do believe it's required to wear a mask from the point of wherever to the classroom Just during the time of instruction in the classroom, you have an optional? Well, that's where I was getting at, but right. that's what you're doing. I mean, I understand what you're saying also. Yeah. Which, and if you made it that way, I guess it's still an optional, regardless of what we said that way. Still wear it, still wear it, still wear it. Yeah, I don't think I don't have a good answer. I, I think if the question basically is require them or don't for certain groups at all. Or, uh, and there will be exceptions. And if you want to talk about all those exceptions, we can sure do that. But I don't think you all want to get that deep in the weeds on this. So if we just strike the whole row, say nothing about masks except for where it says it on the bus, that's the only other place it's uh, hit. Masks required on the bus. We'll just have to revisit it and come up with a compromise. So I guess another motion could be that uh, approve the basic operations plan but strike the row that references masks just understand that we will have to say something about it. something will there will have to be policy in place one way or the other and then we seek guidance from commissioners and shannon or yeah. medical professionals
the, the guidance is very clear uh, on the masks from, from all sources in regard to it, it's not always 100 percent you need to do this. Originally KSD and KDHE said masks should be required for all staff and students but not for elementary age students. And then they've gone to say they took that out that it shouldn't should not be for elementary students. They they changed that. So. so across the board, everybody's recommending to have in some capacity. social distancing is not possible. And I'm talking about junior and high school. That allows a teacher, if they have a few enough people in their classrooms, and we do have some high school classes that are small enough, to be able to separate their students, give them the break from the mask, you know, before they leave class in the or when instruction face-to-face, -face, or when one-on-one -on -one instruction's happening, put the mask on, and then as they get ready to leave the leave the class, have students put the mask on to walk the halls. I, for the high school, I don't know what it looks like for the elementary. Also allows teachers to possibly take their uh, classes to some place like a gymnasium if it's open and have class uh, in there um, without the mask. So there is some leeway in the, the way this is written, the way I see it, to allow those breaks. that would be a solution to allow us to at least make steps forward to strike the mask row approve the plan as it is without that just knowing we're going to have to come to a four votes on something regarding the masks, <laughs> regarding the masks. Yeah. what's that probably on Monday probably yeah I, don't know. I guess one thought of unless we meet before then. And one thought of what Mr. White has said was, you know, as you're thinking about trying to get all the kids, you know, like I was thinking, the terms of them being in the mask all day and the guidelines were good. I'm guessing that, you know, that same assumption, if you have that much of a problem with your child being in the mask all day, you also have an online that way also. Seconded that we approve the reopening plan as revised, removing the restrictions on masks um, to be revisited at a later meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay, so. Uh, this uh, went 
time to let go of the reins a little bit and let Elisa put together almost the entire budget this year. Uh, she did a, a good job with it. <coughs> we, went, we went through it together and finalized everything and then went up and visited with uh, Dale Dennis at the State Department of Education. And, uh, had one minor tweak, uh, one minor change. Said uh, that's one of the best I've seen yet. So we're in good shape. Um, as you know, we we don't have a lot of cash. Uh, where we ought to be, capital outlay is a little light. Uh, our mill levy, with this budget, is increasing about 1.6 mills. That's entirely a function of the drop in valuation. What we saw coming with the oil values dropping and they uh, cut those property values in half on their valuation guide in the state. So uh, that increase is entirely related to that. Otherwise, not many changes from what we've had in previous years. Provided to this document shows the historical on uh, the last 12, 13 years. Tax dollars levied, so that's important to look at. Um, not just the mill rate. See our tax dollars that we'll be levying with this budget is lower than the previous year's average, um, but our mill rate is is higher. Uh, 51.7 is as high as it's been on this. And then our valuation, you can see that 90% drop in valuation really hurt us. So the graph just showing the tax dollars that we've levied historical look at. You can really see with the valuation is high, the mill levy is low, and inverse of that is true as well. So if you, if the board's agreeable to this, we don't need to take action, just consensus, yeah, let's go with this. Um, we can amend uh, this budget during the hearing, we can only go down, lower on the mill levy. Uh, we cannot go higher than what we publish. So the plan would be to publish this budget. If the mill rate is unacceptable to this board, two options would be to reduce the local option budget. That's operating dollars. Um, this looks like it's an increase of 38,000, 30, 40,000. That's not quite true. What we're doing is funding some of that local option budget, like 38,000 with contingency reserve. And then we take our general fund and re replenish the contingency reserve. Why would we do that? If I just put this budget at a million, we'll base our state aid based on a million. If I put it at a million thirty-eight, they'll base the state aid on a million thirty-eight. We'll get maximum state aid, and then behind the scenes we have that shell game with okay, but we're going to fund thirty-eight thousand with local tax dollars or not with with sub, uh, contingency reserve money. So really, our operational budget in the LOB is a million. But we're just trying to maximize the state. Aid. So I can reduce that, I can take more out of contingency to fund that, but that's going to take away from operational dollars. That's not a good situation. Uh, the other solution would be to lower our capital outlay mill levy. You know all the challenges we have with our capital outlay fund uh, and our needs. Those don't quite match up. The money we have compared to what we have to do Since we're okay with this, to go ahead and publish this. Okay. Okay. 
And uh, the meeting, I've got it scheduled for 7 a.m. August 24th. Are we all comfortable with that? Yeah, what day is that? Monday. Monday the 24th, 7 a.m. Okay. Well, we send that to the person that, not in person, right? Right, like that guy. Yeah. 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 The there you go. Guy has to bring yeah. Yep. And as of now, that's all we would have on the agenda, but <clears throat> we may have other things we have to deal with. Okay. Maybe our HVAC, too. I don't think I'll be ready for that next week. So we can tack that on to that meeting. Okay. okay. Motion to adjourn. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Both <coughs> same side. Motion carried. Sure, you pass up.